I'm Ryan Frederick. I'm a principal at AWH. Uh, we build software products and solve data challenges for clients. Um, and I've got, and this is Startup Grime. And historically, we would do this in person with some pizza and beer, and typically at Rev One's main event room. But you know, in pandemic mode, we've gone virtual, and and we've done a couple of these now virtually. Seem to go off okay. I appreciate everybody attending and participating. Um, and um, certainly Nathan for your time and, and willingness to jump on a Zoom at, at six o'clock on a Monday evening with no beer and beer and pizza being provided. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, and Alex Brown um, from uh, Dickinson Wright, um, longtime supporter of Startup Brine, and contributes. And, and one of the things that I va I've valued out of the virtual one so far is how much um, I can pick on Alex and sort of ask him to chime in on the conversation. Um, so that's been fun and, and good. So Alex, appreciate your support of Startup Ryan over the years and your participation in the in the virtual ones. Hey, you bet. Happy to help. So Nathan, um, Healthy Roster is is the current company and the current gig. Uh, but let's give some give people some context of pre-healthy roster so they know um, a, a little bit about how you're wired and, and your perspective on startups and trying to build a company. And, and we're going to focus the conversation mostly around, you know, re redirects. And, and I like to use that term rather than pivots because I think pivot it has, you know, been well-worn. So I like to call them redirects instead of pivots. So we're going to talk about that and focus in that area. But what, what, what did the world hold for Nathan before Healthy Roster became a thing? Well, I'm, at, I'm officially getting to that old man stage for being an entrepreneur. This is, I think, year 25. And I've done three of my own funded startups and kind of a mixed bag of success. I think my first one, I was 23 or four, right out of college. I did an online job board back before, you know, Monster was a thing. Um, and then did another one for video about 10 years later and, and now healthy roster. And in between I've just I've run other people's companies or, or worked at other firms. Um, I found a real natural cycle to my energy levels and interests in running companies or starting companies based on how hard the fall was from the previous one. And then how young my kids have been at certain stages of, of, of timing on that. So. Yeah, so that's my background. Is there anything that you've learned as part of the, the, the process of starting different companies and building different products that has been a common thread and sort of carried throughout? Or are they so different because you're building a different product to solve a different problem in a different space that, there, that there's very little sort of carryover and commonality? You know, what's really interesting is the carryover and commonality is that it's just hard. So it doesn't really matter what you're building, just starting from nothing and building something from scratch is just really hard. Um, I found that timing is, is really important. Um, where you are in a certain industry's evolution for a need of a product is probably more important than a lot of things that we give credit to. Um, and then I think team is the other thing. And, and I've learned all these lessons kind of along the way. It's not like you, you know, do a startup and then all of a sudden, oh yeah, all five of these things matter. You kind of stumble through your first one and, and hopefully you get enough of it right that you have success. And I was able to sell my first one and it didn't put me in the driver's seat to, you know, never have to work again, but it also showed me some initial success for the effort. And then the second one didn't work at all. And I learned a couple more things specifically about team. And then this third one, I, you know, I'm but I'm, I'm 45 now. I've been doing this now five and a half years. So I, I started this um, when I was 40 and I was like, I should know this by now. And I, <laughs> did. I, I knew a lot more than I did the previous two, but never enough and never enough that it's easy. So it's still been hard and it's still been like, oh yeah, that, this is important. I, I didn't realize that. And I still have those moments all the time. Do you, do you think that you so the first one the job board you were you know early 20 ish um 
did you did you know what doing a startup and sort of being a founder meant and were you sort of intentionally going down that path and and scratching an itch or was it just you had the ability to build this product and you said all right i'll take a stab at it and if it if it works cool and if it doesn't i'll just go get a job somewhere where if you if you if you remember i you know uh, you know I'm, I'm even older than you are. So, um, I know that it can be a challenge sometimes going back that far to remembering what you were thinking, but do you remember where your head was at at that point? Yeah, it really wasn't that difficult for me. I started off life as a technical recruiter and I was working in Atlanta. And when I said timing means more than a lot of things, this is kind of a great example, right? So I started working um, for, uh, you know, a, a consulting company and I was a, a young recruiter and uh, everybody was, you know, coming in on a Monday morning and seeing what the fax machine was spitting out. And there would just be rolls and rolls and rolls of resumes from ads they placed in the newspaper. And, you know, they'd spend the next three days just going through those and trying to figure out who was a match and who wasn't. And all of a sudden, you know, it popped up on my radar that there was a website called the Atlanta Computer Job Store. And I was like, well, that seems a hell of a lot more efficient than a fax machine and a newspaper ad. And so I posted a, I think it was a gig for Delta, a development gig for Delta as I was in Atlanta. And I think I filled six spots in, in under a week. And, you know, that just blew everybody away who had been doing it through the facts and newspaper for, you know, all their time. And it was like, oh, this is a real moment where you're seeing an evolution of, of, of industry or an evolution of technology lead to more efficiency. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, this is something I should pay attention to. And so I'm using this site, I'm being successful as a recruiter and I'm married. It's like, like I said, I'm 23, 24, we're not two years out of college and my wife's mom got sick and she, you know, my wife was from Columbus. And so it's like, you know, oh, we got to move to Columbus cause we got to take care of our family. And then all of a sudden you're like, all right, let's do this. And you're not thinking about your job or your career anymore. And I get to Columbus and it's like, all right, so I'm a recruiter. And by the way, where's your Atlanta computer job store? And of course, there was no Columbus Computer Job Store. And it was like, oh, well, I need that to be successful. I can't even envision doing it without it. And so I was like, well, I, I guess we got to build this. And so I had done web development in college. And back in 98, 97, 98, it was still pretty bare bones website development type stuff. So I could mock and do a lot of it. Um, I didn't do the back end stuff, but I got enough where I was able to go to you know somebody who had been looking to make investments and then I got an angel investor and off we went. So yeah, I mean, timing and then circumstance, you know, led to kind of that, that career path, not because I thought entrepreneurial career paths were even a thing at that point. How can someone validate whether the timing is, is good or bad and, and be honest with themselves about whether it's good or bad? So that's something that as I've started more companies, I've really started to focus in on um, I always feel like, you know, I've always treated my career and, and my ability to, to, to engage with the entrepreneurial community in, in this way. It's, I will sit down and have coffee with anybody or spend time talking about these things with anybody because it's so, so hard. Like, there's so many potholes. And if you can just help somebody avoid one of them, like, you're saving them, like, weeks of stress or, or pain or, or even more. And it's like, there have been plenty of people that have helped me do that in my life. And it's like, that's, that's how I like to pass it down. So I've been talking to a lot of actually kids out of like OSU and, and their, pro, um, their program there. And the thing I urge everybody to do, and this really doesn't matter how old you are, is if you're starting a business, is you've got to find out that people are willing to pay for what you have. Like that's got to be the first premise of anything. It's not what you think is really cool and efficient. It's what does somebody else really want to pay for? And not just to tell you it's great, but actually be willing to sign their names to, I will pay for this if this, if this exists. And I, I just stress that, man. When we started Healthy Roster, um, we didn't, we had an idea that this might be that, you know, building an EMR, a medical records um, platform for athletic trainers, which we'll get into obviously what Healthy Roster is, but that at its core is what it is. We had an idea that was necessary, but we weren't sure if anybody was going to pay for it. And it wasn't until we got in front of Ohio Health and their sports medicine director that we said, hey, by the way, we've seen the software you guys use. Do you like it? And everyone at the table was laughing, you know, like, oh, no. And, and they didn't like it. And we're like, all right, that's step one. We're like, 
what if we built you, you know, this a mobile version that does, you know, telemedicine and has a couple bells and whistles. And they're like, you can't do that. And we don't even believe that you would be able to do that for us. And we're like, no, 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 just trust us. If we could do that, would you buy? And he's like, I'd sign right away. I said, would you sign now saying that if we built and delivered this for you and you didn't have to pay until then? And he said, yes. And it was like, oh, okay. That, that's a huge statement, right? Big healthcare system, defined need, and somebody willing to sign their name to it. So before we even had a product, we had six hospitals sign up to buy it. So that was a big signal that, man, if we do this right, there's going to be a lot of other hospitals that are going to want this. And we didn't know anything about the industry to that point. But in six months, we knew there was demand and it was worth paying for. Yeah, I think the and I totally agree with you. The timing piece is is critical because, and Steve Blank um, has done some actual like research and and statistical analysis around this, and he believes that that more startups fail because of a startups that had the potential. Let me put it that way to succeed. Um, more of those fail because the timing is just off, you know, than than any other factor. Um, and it's and it's difficult to to sort of internalize whether you timing is on your side or if timing isn't on your side, because we sort of want to believe that if timing isn't quite on our side, that somehow we're going to be able to overcome that um, through hard work or the right partnership or or whatever. And that's almost never the case. If timing is 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 a headwind. And you can't see when it's going to shift and, and be a tailwind. That that's really a difficult. Uh, that's a difficult journey. I don't even know that you can ever tell. Like Facebook hit the right spot at the right time to transform how people viewed their friendships, and it took off. And it and it's obviously, you know, has grown to what it is today. I, I don't know that anybody really knows that that's going to be the path, and that everybody's going to take to something because it's the right time. I think people are lucky and that's okay. You know, identifying a need and building a great product, those aren't luck things, right? But timing sometimes is, and, and so is, you know, speed of adoption. Um, so I just, you know, if somebody's willing to pay for it in some way, I think it's a really good sign that you've got at least this, the formation of a, 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 a business worth investing more and more time into. Yeah, well said. Um, so let's dig into healthy roster a little bit more. What's the, the healthy roster founding story? At, at what point did you think about healthy roster and how did the problem sort of, you know, um, appear? And then how did you decide that it, this was the next thing? Yeah. Uh, in that period of time, after my second startup, I was running other web businesses. And one of them that I ran was called Digital Scout. And Digital Scout was actually a legacy company here in Columbus for a really long time. Uh, very niche. Um, it built websites for school districts and it built um, stat tracking apps for high school coaches. And um, so I put about three or four years into that and got the stat tracking for high school coaches piece really going. And we turned around and sold that division of it to a company out of Atlanta. And as I did that, I spun out with it from the local ownership to the Atlanta ownership and spent another year or so kind of integrating the product to their, their, their product. And in that time, spent a lot of time dealing with high school associations, dealing with concussion blowback from the NFL. And so if you remember back when Will Smith did that um, movie talking about concussions and, and kind of shining a spotlight on, you know, what happens when, when NFL players get concussions and, and, the early onset of dementia and, and everything else. Um, high schools thought that was the end of football. High school associations thought that was the end of high school football because they didn't have the money nor the, the medical prowess to deal with that. And so as we were dealing with high school associations, we were kind of wondering, like, who takes care of the athletes? Like when we were in school, the athletic trainer was taping ankles. And as a kid, you don't know the background of that athletic trainer. You don't know their, you know, you don't know their, um, their school background. You don't know their, their training background. I didn't even know they worked for hospital systems. Turns out they do. And so as we dug into that, we started looking at those folks who are on the sidelines taking care of athletes and going, well, how do they manage 
how do they manage the injury? How do they manage the communication around it? How do they manage the rehab of these things? And we found that they were just using crappy software or pen and paper. And so when your son or daughter gets hurt playing high school sports or college sports, primarily high school, because that's the parents are involved at that level, how do you know they have a concussion? Well, the, a, the AT would tell the, the kid that you got your bell rung and tell mom or dad that you really shouldn't you know, do anything for a couple of days. And of course, the kid was not telling mom or dad any of that information. And so just lots of things fall through cracks that when you have you know, holes in your communication process. So what we thought was, man, we could end that. We could make it a lot easier and um, just allow ATs to directly communicate with mom and dad through an app. And it was so foreign to their space. But as soon as we showed it, uh, my example with Ohio Health was, my God, this fixes so many problems we deal with. And we're like, well, that, that seems to be it. So the Healthy Roster was founded by myself, Dan Franzak, and Sean Price. And all three of us were at Digital Scout. And we all spun out from the acquiring company about after about a year and just said, we want to take a run at this. And that, that's how we got our start. So it's, it's something that might be not obvious on the surface is you, your, your customer from a buyer perspective, it sounds like is a, a health system that it is then contracting the trainers out to schools it's not the schools buying healthy roster to sort of track and manage the health and wellness of the, the athletes, right? Although, I mean, they obviously are, are a user and a participant in the platform, but your buyer, it sounds like by and large is a health system. So again, yes. And, and to that point, timing again, played a crucial part here is that in the industry, the industry has, has ebbed and flowed over the years, but as we caught it, high schools were no longer hiring athletic trainers themselves. Health systems were coming in and providing athletic trainers as a way to promote their, their hospital systems to parents whose kids are getting injured playing high school sports. In a nutshell, how health invests in athletic trainers and puts them out at high schools all over Columbus because they want mom and dad to know that they are going to take care of the kids when they get hurt. And it furthers the belief that Ohio Health is your community uh, brand. And so ultimately that's, that's why Ohio Health invests in over a hundred athletic trainers. And that's why they not only give them for free, they will bid and put marketing dollars behind certain high schools. Awesome. Yeah. So hospitals invest in that kind of stuff because they want their brand out in front of mom and dad. And we didn't know that, but we didn't know that the industry was moving towards that. But as soon as we found out health systems were willing to buy, I had already, I'd already been in a business that had sold directly to high schools and school districts. And it's a nightmare. Like there's no fun in dealing with a school board and trying to get them to pay $2,500 for a website, which should be a no brainer. But to them is like, you know, for good reasons, you no, know, not every school district has that kind of disposable income. And even the ones that do would fight you on the value of it. So I, I had no interest in building a business that was selling directly to schools, selling to health, health, healthcare systems. Yeah, now that that I was interested in because I thought I thought the space and and the industry was ripe for taking technology and and providing a good solution. So the athletic trainers for the health systems are really market makers for them because I'm I'm assuming they want the trainers in the market engaging with the student athletes being visible to, you know, coaches, being visible to parents. So if there's, uh, if there's an MCL, you know, tear or an ACL or an Achilles or something like that, that, that procedure and then the, the rehab and the, the care around that is going to happen at an Ohio health facility. And, and so the athletic trainers in a certain sense are sort of business development agents for a health system. Yeah, they call them outreach and for exactly that reason. So um, they don't work at hospital systems. They don't actually work with hospital software. And so, you know, the big hospital softwares are Epic and Cerner. And these are big medical record companies that Ohio Health probably put $100 million into Epic, installing Epic in their systems. But the athletic trainers don't touch those systems. So the docs who are in those systems don't see the notes of the athletic trainers. So that was another big piece. It's like, well, we can do an integration to Epic and they're like, no, you can't. That's not even possible. And it's like, 
trust us, it, it, it can be done. It's not easy because your IT department actually has to do work, but trust us, it will be done. And I say that kiddingly, the, the IT departments at hospitals are really competent. It's just they have so much on their plates with their current systems that connecting the little software companies like us is, is not highest priority. But when you do, that transfer of information becomes so significant to the sports medicine doctors and the PTs who are at the hospital systems that Ryan, that, that piece of putting people in the field works really well when all that information is easily transferable back and forth. And so that's what we focus on is just driving that kind of um, efficiency and in information exchange. I know when we've talked before, and I think the, the last time that we actually were together was that there, Dublin you know, was holding a series of, of um, um, the only thing I can think of is to call it a reality events because there was something in the name where they were calling it the reality series or something. Um, and, and, and you were on a panel that I was moderating. Um, and it's, um, so in some ways that seems like it was yesterday and in some ways that seems like it was five years ago. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, that's what happens inside of a pandemic, I guess. Yeah. Um, it, but I know, you know, talking to you then that, that you guys have intentionally kept the team at healthy roster, pretty lean and pretty small. And, and that, and, and you like it that way. So that sounds like a very intentional approach not to grow the team, you know, beyond what you guys can legitimately accomplish and want to accomplish, you know, with the product and with the company. How do you sort of encourage others to do that and sort of pass that on? Cause you guys have raised money at healthy roster. So it's, it's, it's not like the team, it's not like you're completely, you know, constrained from, you know, a, a capital perspective. So the team could be bigger if you wanted it to be bigger, but you intentionally keep it small. How do you sort of think about that? Because I run into lots of founders across the country who, you know, they raise some money and, and, and then their, their belief is we've got to immediately now grow the team exponentially to justify raising this money because a bigger team somehow correlates to product and company success. How do you sort of think about that correlation between team size and what you want to accomplish? Well, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. One, we've raised money. We've raised about $5 million all locally within the state, all through Rev1 type investors. So Queen City Angels, Rev1, North Coast Angels, um, NCT. So your, your normal grab bag of, of local um, investors, Tamron Hill is another one. Um, and it's, it's been fantastic. So I don't have any real negative stories about fundraising, but by doing that, um, we have never raised a singular um, $5 million round like an A round would. And, and there's lots of reasons why. One is that's really hard to do around here. There just aren't a lot of people doing it. Two, um, the people that are doing it don't necessarily kind of align with the type of business that we run. For instance, we sell to healthcare companies with extremely long decision and, and, and uh, sales processes. Our, our sales processes are six to 10 months and the average contract value is under 10 grand. That's not a great connective, you know, set of, um, uh, of um, uh, data points there. Nathan, um, that does not sound very investable. Right, right. Well, it is over time because the, the, the lifetime value of a customer is huge, right? We don't, we'll, we'll, we, our churn is at like 2% or 3%. So, and that's lifetime. So in the five years, we've lost just a few customers. And the, I think the, the value of the business grows, but it takes some time. So those first five years that we're, we're building, we're building a nice ARR that doesn't churn out but that's not really super investable, as you said, not yet. Um, it, it also, you know, when you were talking about pivots slash, you know, kind of turning points, it's like finding a bigger market than sports medicine has been something we've known pretty much from day one that we were going to have to do. There's a finite number of athletic trainers. There's a finite number of, of hospital systems that, that, that buy and, and pay for that kind of stuff. So if that's the case, you know, we've used that $5 million to get to about 20 people and, 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 um, and, um, employee size. 
we couldn't just go hire 20 right away. That, that wasn't going to be a, a recipe for success. We knew it was going to be a longer road before we could show value that an A round would be of interest. And we're almost there. And, and I think we're probably going to get to there, that point in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and, and we're, we're busting at the seams in some areas. So it's, it's not always comfortable. Like, man, scaling customer success at this size with this many customers is really tough when you don't, when you can't just throw bodies at a problem. And then dev too, like half our company, almost half our company is developers. And it's like, we probably could use two more minimally. And uh, we just, we don't have enough revenue to do that yet. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's start talking about um, pivots and, and redirects. That was a good segue on your part. It, so you've known that you were going to move beyond sort of sports medicine for, for a while and that you had to, um, had you already started looking at, at opportunities to do that? And, and then, you know, did the pandemic um, create a, a, a new opportunity and, and a new sort of set of problems that you then saw as an opportunity to capitalize on? Yeah, I, I guess I should be clear. We need a new market if we want to raise another round and get to a, a, an investable size. Our core business in sports medicine, if we want to build a business that, you know, is solid and, and has profits and, and grow that business slowly, we can do that. But we took investment money because there was belief that we could have an exit event at some point. And it's probably a much greater chance for us to build and, and get a bigger market to get to that exit event. So because we took that money, I think it, 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 it behooves us to go and make sure that we try everything we can within reason to get to a bigger market, especially when there are available ones, which there are. So for us, that available market was occupational health. So little known thing is that there are actually athletic trainers that work in industrial uh, um, and, and um, emergency services organizations or, or companies. So think um, Hondas of the world, um, you know, anybody who's got manufacturing going on or anybody who's got an active workforce, injuries happen. And so to mitigate the amount of workers' comp claims, they hire athletic trainers on staff to help them um, primarily keep those injury numbers down and keep their workforce healthy. So we've known that, but we didn't realize what kind of opportunity there was, especially using a software platform like what we have. So... Um, we've made a direct commitment to building out software services that help industrial companies, primarily by offering virtual athletic training access. So how do we allow Ohio Health, who has athletic trainers at Honda, how do we let them do that for lots of companies that might not be able to afford a full-time athletic trainer, but can do it through software, through virtual, through telehealth, essentially. And uh, so that's what we started focusing on about almost 12 months before the pandemic hit, maybe 10 months. And we were just about to launch a major partnership with Ohio Health in March. We had already done three sales visits with our customers and then the pandemic hit and it put everything on hold. So unfortunately we were roaring to go, you know, just ready to kind of push out a new service layer with Ohio Health and the pandemic absolutely stopped that in its tracks. Um, I don't think it, it, ended it by any means, but it, it's put it on hold for a good, you know, while well, we're at four months now. Yeah. But you, but you, did you, cause you have released a new product yeah. uh, and, and was, was that an evolution out of the work on the new product with Ohio health around the, the occupational sort of health and, 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 and wellness, or did you guys, just sort of see when when that was coming to a halt because of the pandemic did you see all right we've got the bones for this sort of covid-19 related company team wellness tracking you know management app you know it, it, how did how did the new product come to be and tell tell everybody what it is and what it does yeah so actually it was more of the latter we had the bones of a, a survey platform already in place. In fact, our athletic trainers were using it for uh, depression screening with our athletes. And so because we had the Oc Health and because we had the employer awareness and because COVID hit, we're like, man, we're going to need some safety net revenue here. We don't know how bad this is going to be on our core, core product sales. 
our core selling months are May, June, July, and August, of course. Um, that's when everybody is buying the new software before the school systems get back to athletics, both high school and college. And so we're like, this is the worst time this could hit and we better have some kind of revenue we can bring in. The good news is it looks like schools are, are coming back into uh, and sports are going to be on, on uh, the recovery here and people are going to go back and start. But we were like, we better come up with something. And so we looked at that screening platform and said, well, we can do a COVID-19 screening platform. And so we came up with uh, Safer Workplace and Safer Play, which uh, Safer is our survey platform. And it essentially allows us to send out a text message every day, a scheduled text message that has a, a COVID-19 survey in it, uh, basically a symptom survey. And it's off the CD web, CDC website, the, sur the symptoms. And we just allow organizations to create a process where they can communicate with their employees or their athletes and ask them every day before they get into the office or, or, or facility, how are you feeling and have you had symptoms? And we looked at that as a short-term revenue play, but also an important piece that had meaning in the world today too. So it was kind of a, you know, it was a dual effort. We felt really strongly that people would be able to use this for better and, and keep more people healthy and we thought you know companies are going to be willing to pay something for this and it a short-term revenue will help us keep people employed so one of the things that it's easy to forget about when you think about a new product and sort of a, a a redirect is it's not just about building the product right it's not just about designing screens and writing code you've got to come up with pricing you've got to come up with messaging and you've got to come up with you know branding around it you know etc um, it, it, how easy was it for you guys to, you know, develop and, and how quickly did you come up with sort of the business stuff around it outside of the, the, the product wrenching to actually make it something that, that worked? Uh, that probably took two weeks of really intense meeting times over zoom. Um, but that was only the baseline, right? You don't actually know if any of this stuff is going to work when you kind of create the, the new product. So pricing and and decks and the way we pitch that's all on evolution what we did know is that it was in high demand so we started doing webinars and one webinar had um 290 signups and had 278 attendees wow uh, those, are, those are amazing numbers i've never seen anything like it i mean i've been doing this 25 years i've never seen a webinar or anything similar to that and it was like okay we, we really have something here that people need and so now we've got to figure out over the next couple of weeks, how do we sell this effectively? And, and that's, still a, that's still a work in progress, believe it or not, after a couple of months. Can't you just do a webinar like every other hour? I know, right? Yeah, I mean, we did kind of max out our email lists and our, our social um, ad spends on, on doing that kind of stuff. And we, we do about two a week. And those numbers don't exist anymore, of course. But we're still getting 20 to 50 on every webinar and, you know, We've, we've had, I think, um, since we started promoting it April 1, I think we have 580 um, registrations for pricing information or proposals. So that includes, you know, getting a demo and then getting pricing. But man, from a webinar to getting, you know, close to 600 leads, it's, it's really been amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. What, what do you... Um, as it's evolving and you're sort of learning more about that space and, and you're, you're figuring out how that product exists with, with the rest of the products and then, you know, potentially, you know, long-term with the occupational, you know, wellness piece. Um, how do you think about it, you know, fitting in? Do you see it as a, as a, as a long-term piece of the puzzle or is this, is this a bridge? How, how are you sort of now, you, you, are you? I guess the question is: Are you making a transition from being opportunistic around it to now getting strategic around it? Yeah. So um, I probably buried the lead on this, but our first customer was the PGA Tour, and so the PGA Tour used um, Safer Play to get all their golfers, all the caddies, and all of the event staff back two weeks ago, and they use it every day. Uh, everybody from Tiger Woods down to their um, their minor league tour use it every day for their symptoms, and so. We're just getting to a point where we can start doing a PR release around that. And we look at that as like anchoring us in the sports market as 
a dominant player serving, you know, multiple types of needs for big time leagues. Um, that's also led to um, introductions at MLS, uh, Major League Soccer, and then uh, believe it or not, WWE wrestling, um, all of which, you know, wouldn't have been in our wheelhouse before, but now are. So we're looking at this as kind of like, man, we can do this for you and we can, we can attack a lot of different issues you're dealing with from the sports space. But on the employer side, it's like, you don't know us. So it's not, you're not adopting us as quickly on this, but this platform can be used not only for COVID, but you could start looking at this as a way to screen for, um, you know, we can do any kind of screening that you need. So this can be done for um, mental health. This can be done for uh, drugs and alcohol. This can be done for anxiety. You can start screening your employees in lots of different ways. Um, but for the employer side, we've gone the reseller route because they don't know us. They're not as likely or quick to say, you know what, healthy roster, we're turned to work. Yeah, that, that makes sense to us. But they are, they are willing and interested to, to talk to their TPA, their third party administrator that deals with their HR benefits. They are willing to hear from them that this is a product they should be doing. And that's actually that channel uh, for us has been really good. And we've, we've got about eight channel partners in the last, three weeks worth of effort. So even with that, selling direct to companies we had to figure out was much easier if we went through a third party channel. So for, for those that, that don't know, um, who's, who's, who's a TPA? What's a, what's a you know, typical company that people would recognize as a, as a TPA? Um, well, Sedgwick and there are a couple of, um, um, Sedgwick's the biggest one. They've all been kind of acquired recently. York is another one. Around here anyways, those are two noticeable names. Um, they're, they're basically groups that work both sides of the aisle. They work with the employer to try and minimize the amount of health care you use. And they work with the healthcare care uh, company to, to streamline the submission process of any workers' comp claims that come down the pipe. So they are they sit in between... Um, the employer and the workers' comp agencies and try and streamline the process. So those folks are imminently aware of what happens when you get a workplace injury and then also what happens when COVID kind of takes, uh, you know, starts spreading in your work environment. So they're very cognizant of keeping bills down and they don't want, you know, COVID spreading in, in, in a facility and they see a solution like ours as a way to mitigate that and, and control risk. So the the, um, the two product the, the new product has sort of two versions two two flavors safer play and the other one is what's that one called again? Uh, safer workplace. I mean, safer is the survey platform, and we just brand it based on whether we're selling to sports or we're selling to employers. How different are those those products? How 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 big is the fork growing between them? Well, for those two, it's the exact same thing. So it's just a branding effort on. You know, if we if we sold safer workplace to the PGA, they might think it's a little weird, so we tagged it as safer play instead. But the idea and the, the the actual product itself is the exact same thing. They use the exact same surveys, the exact same alert systems, the notifications that go out to the organization that's deploying it when when a positive result comes back. They're all the same. Do you see that being the case for a little while, or do you think that they're going to? start to become a little bit more niche and, and focused as, as you work with customers on each side? And do you see them sort of, you know, maybe having a common trunk, but, you know, the, the functionality becoming a little bit more uh, user and, and customer driven based upon what, a, what, a, what an athletic league or, or, you know, group might need like the PGA versus, you know, what a, a manufacturing company might need? Or do you think that they're, they're so close that even though on the surface they seem very different, that the fundamentals are, are almost never going to change? You know, it's a good question. It's one that's still kind of developing for us because we're not quite deep into Oc Health yet. I think they're going to diverge. And I think what you'll have is a core system that sports medicine slash AT users use. And then, you know, a set of enhancements like Safer Play that work really well for sports organizations. But I can see us getting into performance metrics for sport uh, for um, sports medicine. So, you know, tracking, you know, exertion, tracking, you know, 
um, all sorts of, of um, output from practices so that you can understand what that does to the body. Those things will really be primarily used in sports medicine, high school, college realm. On the other side, I can see HR driving a whole set of other enhancements around forms and things that are needed from their side to cover themselves when they go to, you know, an injury that goes to um, workers comp. So yeah, they'll probably diverge. The base system will probably stay the same for athletic trainers though. So you, you've, you've done a pretty nice um, redirect here with the new product. Um, and it's now going to move from being opportunistic to strategic and you're already having some really good success with it. What advice would you give to uh, founders and startups that, that, you know, ha haven't identified that opportunity yet to, you know, do something different and, and to um, not only, you know, um, survive, you know, during the pandemic or at any point, but, but thrive. Um, what, what, are, are there some, you know, some principles that, that you think apply to anybody's company and anybody's business that, that they can leverage? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I look at my role as CEO I, first, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I've got two really competent co-founders, right? So that can help mitigate a lot of stress, but it also helps you focus in on what you're good at and what you're supposed to do. And my role for the company is to keep us funded and keep money in the bank and make sure everybody gets paid as a base level. And most CEOs are right. So, I mean, that's, that's what, that's your goal. Don't run out of money. Um, to us, that meant we had to move fast so that in case COVID crushed our sales pipeline for the biggest part of our year, we weren't standing there six months, you know, with, with less than six months, months of cash and going, what do we do now? There was too many people counting on that. So, we made a move to, to try and bring in some temporary non-dilutive revenue and just mitigate that, that risk. Um, it has consequences though. Like our, our CS team is completely stressed out and bringing on a whole set of customers that aren't used to who we are and what we do is also very difficult. And so there's a real price you pay for doing that. Constant communication is key. Um, we hold town halls every month where we do standups via Zoom, you know, every day for our groups. I try and be on as many of those as possible. So I guess my, my takeaway from this is move quickly if it makes sense to you. Always communicate as much as you possibly can and be as transparent as you can as to why you're doing it so that they stay on board, your, your team stays on board with everything. And then, man, stay, stay in touch with your teams as they're fighting through this because you've put – a lot of, I have, I put a lot of pressure on my individual teams to support this effort because I know it's good for us. I know we need to do it. That doesn't mean it's not really hard for them. And so that's what I try and keep in mind and, and stay on those calls with them. Is, is Tiger calling in and being a total pain in the ass? <laughs> yes, actually he is. Uh, his assistant, not, not Tiger. So um, getting the app on his phone was like a six day process. Um, but the funny part is, is that those things happen all the time and it doesn't just happen with elite golfers, right? It happens with athletic trainers who are in their 60s and have done pen and paper their entire career. Or it is just a slew of, you know, things you just don't expect when you roll new things out. And it seems so obvious and like, how could you possibly have this issue? And then all of a sudden you do. And now you're, you're, you're struggling with how do we get efficient systems up to help mitigate all the people that are complaining about this? You mentioned, and, and we weren't um, prepared to talk about this, but you've mentioned customer success a couple of times. And I've actually never had this conversation with anybody before. Um, how critical is the customer success team and their ability to um, support customers and users effectively in an empathetic way that, that gets them on the product and, and receiving value. Because we, we, we often you know, think of customer success teams associated to enterprises and big companies, right? Where you've got you know, tens of thousands of customers. How important has the customer success team for you guys been? Uh, it's probably the most important division in our company. Um, I, I wouldn't take away from our developers or anybody else. And, and I'm sure Sean, you know, feels, and, and so do I, you know, you have to start with good product. 
otherwise your your CS team's always in crisis mode. And so I'm really lucky. If if, if anybody out there knows Sean Price, um, they probably know that he's you know a top end developer and has built a really solid team around it. And so we don't have a lot of buggy software, and that really helps. I mean, I've been on other ends where I've walked into companies and taken them over, and and it's just a mess, and there's no real way to get yourself out of it except to rebuild it and that causes such tremendous stress on your cs team when your product's buggy and it's not that we don't have bugs we get bugs obviously and and we work through them but in general i found that you know i owned cs before we hired somebody to run it for us and i i felt like if we had the right approach to cs and the right attention given to it we would limit churn, and that was really important when we're selling a you know a um, under ten thousand dollar product that takes six months to sell. We couldn't be you know spitting out these customers that you know every twelve months it just wasn't going to work, and so we just made a dedicated effort to do that. But even when you do that, it's still tremendously stressful when you throw in you know redirects of products and temporary solutions to g- create revenue just creates undue amount of stress on your, on your CS team. Yeah. It, how did, how did you deal with the fact that um, investing in a CS team and infrastructure to support? Cause I think the argument could also be made if, if your average customer is paying less than 10, 10 grand a year, that investing heavily in CS doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Cause you don't have, because you don't have, you know, customers that, that are, are, big revenue and, and profit centers, right? And, and so I think that someone could take the other side of that argument and say, that's not a warranted investment. I agree with you, by the way, but I think that that how hard of a decision was that to invest in CS, given the fact that y- you have customers that don't um, have a big spend with you? Well, until you can afford it, own it yourself, I guess would be my first message to any founder. Um, when you can afford, like we started slow and, and added as we could. We, we hired one person and he became, he became the bedrock of our CS department because he knew the product better than anybody else. He was great with customers. And, you know, so we just supported him as much as we could. And then when we could hire the next one, we did. And we, we grew it organically based on the number of customers we had. When we made the decision to invest in a kind of a, a I would call her a director of CS because she hadn't done it before, but she was really good at account-based selling. The goal for us was not to lose the customer focus, but also to start driving ancillary revenue through additional cross-sells and upsells. And when we did that, it made just such a tremendous jump for us in not only revenue, but in satisfi- um, you know, the, the satisf- uh, the, how customers were satisfied with our product because we were showing them how to use it better and what more capacity they had any customer you have starts using it in the way that they think is best for them. And then they get blinders on for every other feature you develop. Yes. When they, they recognize a need and want you to develop something because they have a need, they'll start using it. But man, nine times out of 10, you throw out a new feature. Most people just ignore it because they get into this way of using your product. A a director of CS has enough time or a VP of CS has enough time to go, and take those calls with each customer and go, did you know we do this? And you told me you had this problem and we already solved this. And most of the time the customer is like, I had no idea. And, and you, you increase the satisfaction, satisfaction for the customer and you increase your revenue because you're able to upsell. It was a big change for us. And it it happened about 18 months ago for us. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's when you have the conversation with the customer, you know, that sounds something like, well, you're getting our emails and then they say, yeah, probably, but I don't read them. Exactly. Uh, right. Cause you, nobody reads anything. So we can't assume that our customers and our users are reading any of the communication that we send out because it, 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 it holds up to every other sort of, you know, campaign metric, something like less than one and a half percent of your customers, your users are, are reading anything that you send out. So you should assume that they don't know that you have this new feature. Um, right as part of the process even when they ask for it which is the crazy thing we've had customers ask for something we roll it out and then three months later we forget to even check if they are using it and they're not and it's like you asked us for this like we built this because you said it would make a material difference in your lives and so they're always grateful 
and then and then they usually start using it but it does take that prodding to to get there yeah uh well, we've got a few minutes left uh let's open it up for questions if you have a question uh just fire away and and nathan will do his best um are you are you sitting along a river or is that a is that a lake behind you it is neither i am in my backyard and it it has taken us almost 17 years to get some tree cover so and it's just simply my backyard. Oh, because it looks like it, it behind the trees, it actually looks like there's like a river or a lake back there. No, no, no. I wish. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, questions, if, if anybody has them. The uh, occupational health market, uh, do you think that's going to be the market that's big enough for you to go after? I, I'm curious the market sizes as well as where you're planning on targeting. How's it going, Nathan? Good, Warren. Nice to see you. You too. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the market size for occupational health is a billion plus. So that, that's always, that always feels good. I think the, the attackable market is probably in the multiple hundreds of millions. And again, these are really big numbers that really don't mean anything until you start to get a foothold there. Um, I, I, think, I think we could grow our sports medicine, you know, um, space or, or market to probably $20 million um with what we know today there are probably areas of sports medicine we could expand past that so when we look at that it's like man if we're ever going to be a hundred million dollar company it's not going to be in sports medicine most likely and i think there are uh, you know there is that opportunity in our health and it's not like we just pick some random market and so we're going to chase it we actually have core users that spend time in that space um so to answer your question yes i think it's big enough and i think it's worth going after we're not going to commit the entire company to it until I can prove that out, though, with, with reasonable size contracts and, and people willing to, to sign. Any other questions? Carrie here. Uh, Nathan, how, how do you really um, look for leads for sales for business development? So, um, I hired a really smart dude um, out of Updocs, actually. His name's Jason Barr. Um, really, really good guy. Um, built a small SDR team for us, and that consists of two people, so it's not big. Um, but we pound, um, we pound leads that we get from purchasing email, um, email lead lists. We sponsor industry events and, and do webinars with them and all the all the common ways that people go out and get them um but honestly once we start once we started our content engine we're now on hubspot so um we actually have a content um platform or we have a platform that we can feed content into and then distribute it efficiently and then we have two guys that just bang the phones all day long calling into those leads so you don't, you don't use any let's say list brokers like uh info group or down on brass street no, we don't, we don't pay for those, but mainly because our niche audiences are pretty definable. So it's pretty easy for us to go and sponsor like the National Athletic Trainers Association is the association for ATs. So we know we can sponsor, we can, you know, buy their lists and attend their events and we're covering a good portion of the industry. And uh, so that's how we've done it to this point. That's cool. Do you track actually daily or weekly or monthly let's say sales progress in terms of the salesforce.com CRM software and say, okay, I have a thousand leads. I contacted hundred and then 30 said yes. And then actually the conversion is maybe 10. Yeah. The answer is yes. Um, it took us going to Salesforce as our platform uh, of record to do that and then connecting HubSpot. And so one of the key hires we made a little after Jason showed up was um, a RevOps person, a person. So we hired a RevOps person to help us connect all of our pieces together. Uh, cannot tell you the value that person has brought to us. I will not tell you his name because he's not available and I don't want to give him any ideas. But he is uh, fantastic. And he had no background in it. Uh, we hired him out of OSU. Super smart kid who was really aggressive and loved to figure out problems. And I highly recommend anybody who's got a startup that has a little, has a challenge in front of them of, 
of organizing and getting efficient with, with those platforms, go hire somebody to do that. Yes, I, I did have a great experience hiring some people from uh, OSU uh, industrial engineering undergrad degree programs. It's a great yep. program. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Nathan, so you're, pro you're protecting the name of the, the young RevOps chap, but you threw Barr's name out there really quickly. So apparently Barr bring, is bringing no value and you don't care if anybody, if anybody steals him away. Well, I'll tell you what, if he walks after the package he's got, then so be it. I am I'm going to fail to... Uh, confident, confident yeah. that he has loyalty. Yeah, well, he better. <laughs> so no, he, he's, he's, he's a known entity and... and um, I've introduced him to other um, entrepreneurs and he's had coffee with them. He's run a, a couple of, of um, companies before as well. So he's a super smart and sharp guy. And uh, like I said, a lot of us who have done this before and a lot of people I know on the screen, you know, Ryan and Brian and, and Warner, they'll sit with you and they'll talk with you through these things. And so will Jason. He's a good dude. What, what was the conversation like with, with, Sherry, or did you just avoid the conversation with him about Barr, um, you know, coming out of UpDocs and joining your team? He he was the one who strongly suggested that Jason was a good fit. Honestly, um, I know Mike Morgan over at UpDocs, and I know Mark, and Mark's an investor and one of our original, uh, one of our original advisors actually before we even took any money, and uh, they both really loved him. So, and he's been fantastic for us. So, you got to know who to trust. And hopefully, you, you know, as an entrepreneur, you build a network over time um, that you can trust the opinions of people. And I try not to second guess it when people I know and trust say, you know, hey, this is the right way to move on something. Yeah. Uh, no, he's a good guy. Um, Sherry's a good guy. Barr's a good guy. Um, fortunately, you, you surrounded yourself and the company with, with lots of good people and, and lots of good advice. So, I think that is also uh, a credit to you because good people who are experienced and, and have been down this path and, and do good work um, want to work with good people. Um, so I think, um, you know, you deserve some credit for, you know, being the, the nucleus of that and, and getting surrounding yourself with lots of good people. Well, thanks. I, I can't stress enough how team matters and you just illustrated exactly why. I mean, I, I fail at a lot of things all the time and it's because you have good people around you that you fail a little less. And if you can accept that, then you, life's a lot easier. Like I've lived 25 years in a, in a high stress environment and I don't feel that way. So I, I accredit that to having enough people around me that I can go to when I have problems. Yeah. I was, um, my hair was already gray by the time I was 26. So you and I have, have le lived a slightly different stress level over the process of starting companies. So I wish I had, I wish I had, ha had followed your path instead of my, you know, more stressful one, but you know, um, you know, you, you have to, you have to pick your path carefully. You made some better choices than I did that is, have kept you a little bit more under control. Well, listen, anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's such a trite way of saying it, but it's true, man. It's like, you just do anything you can to survive and, and keep moving forward. Like, again, I, I haven't hit a home run yet. I, I hope I do someday, but I've had a really fulfilling path that I've been on and I, I wouldn't have changed any part of it, even the hard parts. And I've absolutely failed and had to close companies that I got funding on. And it's, it's terrible, but man, it builds you and you just keep pushing forward. Yeah, I do think that if there's one thing that I've learned over time, it's that um, every, everything builds muscle, right? So it, you, you, you can build your, your risk muscle, you can build your, you know, uh, sort of tolerance muscle, you can build your agency muscle, right? That you just get more confident over time, um, where you make maybe naive, uninformed, you know, lucky decisions or unlucky ones when you're younger. Um, and, and I think much of this is just you strengthen lots of muscles along the way and through the process and hopefully you learn from it. Um, but if nothing else, then you're at least a little bit stronger through the process. Yeah, I love that. I think that's absolutely hundred percent accurate. Nathan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your flexibility and moving the, the date from last Monday to this Monday as well. I appreciate that very much. Of course. Um, Thank you guys. I appreciate it.
Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Thanks everybody who attended. And uh, Nathan, if they want to get in touch with you to pick your brain a little bit more uh, and to talk about your entrepreneurial journey, is that cool? Can they find you on LinkedIn or Twitter or someplace and hit you up? Sure. Absolutely. I'm, I'm Nathan at healthyroster.com or hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn. Yes, absolutely.